other groups are often having that the change to various UC habitats where they're putting down remote operated vehicles. And they're filming, they're recording the video, and also presenting the video to scientists who are commenting and analyzing. And oftentimes these are live feeds over the internet. So it can be very exciting, very, very addictive to sit there and watch some of these because you never know what they're going to come across. So it can be very fascinating. I'll have to look. I don't think any of these are currently going on live now. But I will look, and if I see that there are any, I'll post a link. I think in, in years past, I was trying to log in during the beginning of class to see if there are some of these in the classroom. But they are ongoing. But I will look. I'll post any links in Canvas if I do see any that are live. There are some underwater DC cameras that are permanent. And those should still be online. I'll post, I'll make second post of those. But the live expedition is the things are currently ongoing. Before we talk about this week's lectures, a um, little course of business. I sent out an announcement on Friday that in two weeks, that's about date, we're having our first exam. The exams are take home style exams. They're going to be based on material from lectures, from what you see in lab. And the questions are on the exam are going to be putting material together, together to answer them. Right? They're take home style exams. They're going to be short essays. Some of it's going to be based on things that you discuss in class. Some of it from the other material that you have are exposed to. That should be a I mentioned in the announcement the best way to prepare for these is by joining up the lecture, taking notes, labs, engaging in the lab, reading the, the text. The exam open Friday the 4th at 5 p.m. and then it is available until 5 p.m. that next Tuesday. So you have a span of several days to address the questions. If it was me, I think I would first look at the question and then think about them and then go back and respond to them. That would be my plan if I was in your shoes. Um, but it's not like you open it and have time and you have to finish it. No, there's no, there's no time involved. You have from that 5 p.m. until 5 p.m. on Tuesday to respond to these questions. If you're going to open it and respond to a few questions and then plan to come back another time and respond to others, just in case we have any problems with Canvas, as we'll speak out all through Canvas, please also have your answer and copy and paste it into some document. Just in case you come back and your answers are gone. You know, I, I hate that. I already answered these questions, but my answer's gone. I won't be able to answer them back. So please try to preserve your answers if you are going to come back again to address them. And just you know, do it normal. As you're answering something, do it in the text editor or something like that. Copy and paste it into your answer. That's what, that's what I would do. We have not had any issues with this in the past, but I've also gave everyone a warning to do that, so I don't know if that counts or not. Um, there, so there is no timing. I think I do, I do see when you answer the exam, sometimes it does say the numbers of minutes that students spent on the exam. And I think it's from when you, when you opened it to when you submitted it. It doesn't matter. Sometimes I see some, it's like, hour and a half. So we sat down, we did it, that's fantastic. And that's about how long it should take to complete the exam. About a lecture period. There are, there are instructions as well. You can utilize your lecture notes, the PDFs of the lectures, the handouts that I give, um, the lab material, the text. But don't need to use Google or searching. Um, don't need to find a paper that addresses that particular problem. So, I question. Do you actually have to do my own 
No, it's not. But that's a great question. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear me. Sound echoing. All right, but that, so you can access materials. I think those there who are prepared and are actively engaging in the course up to the exam will take it. And you may not. You may not need to access any materials. Again, some of these I wouldn't ask so many, but some of the questions on these exams I would ask for the in-person exam. Now I think I try to ask more synthesis type questions where you're putting things together to address a question. But they're still take, I don't know, my guess is 15 minutes to address a particular question. What I will do too, and I've always usually done this in most classes when I have essay questions, I will give you six questions, but you only have to answer five. So you can choose amongst those that you are more most comfortable addressing. All right. Any other questions about the okay. okay. Um all these bills that we covered are we already covered. That'll be like next month, right? Oh of course no. Well that would be me, right? Yeah, so everything up to that week. So this week we're covering cnidarians and tenophores. Next week we're covering echinoderms and hemichordates in lecture and in lab. So everyone will have completed their labs up to that 5 p.m. next Friday. So all that material. If I don't get to material in lecture, I won't be addressing it. We'll be everything from the beginning till 5 p.m. on Friday. Yeah. How long should each short answer be? Oh, like? very good, very good question. Because sometimes these answers can be quite long. And I think, you know, I, I, I agree that a short essay question can be rather open-ended in terms of, he's asking about this, but does he also want me to address this? It should all be encompassing within the question, and that's the difficulty I face in terms of coming up with a question that is explicit enough such that you can address it without thinking it's too open-ended. So that's my challenge for you. If, during the course of the exam, you have a question on one of the questions, Send me an email and I'll try to address it. Tuesday at four, probably I may not be able to get to it in time for it to be in use, but you have several days. At least look at the questions, make sure you understand the question. I have had situations where students did not quite grasp exactly what the question was. Some asked me about it and then were able to respond to it appropriately. Some did not and kind of, you know, they were out over here when I was asking about this. So feel free to ask for clarification. That's my challenge, to write a good question. And I always try to come up with new questions every year, so they're not always perfect. So definitely ask for clarification. And in terms of length, typically it's a few paragraphs. And sometimes I will praise those of you who can write very tersely and give a very you know, you know, appropriate, though short, response to that. But those are much easier to grade. The long ones that cover all kinds of tangential information take forever to grade. These, these exams take a long time to grade. Good question. And I'll try to be explicit in the question itself. Any other questions? So today and Wednesday and then this week in lab, we're going to be covering Nidarians and Tinafores. First today, talking about aspects of Nidarians. And then we'll be going through the different major groups of Nidarians, briefly discuss about phylogenetic hypothesis. And I believe today, chances are we're probably only going to get through to here. Then we'll discuss the tenophores, the comb jellies, and 
as we started the lecture on sponges, we'll continue that with a discussion about which group is the most basal of the animals. It's, it, we don't have answers to that question. But in terms of the implications as to whether it's the tinophores, the cone jellies, or the sponges who are the most basal. Before we do any of that, I want you, on Wednesday, when we covered sponges, think about from the reading of the chapter, Continuous Forms in My Dearness, what was something interesting that you learned about these phyla, one or the other? And then, if you've had any unique experiences with the Nidarian or Tinafor that you'd like to share with the class. Volunteers. What was something interesting that you didn't know, or that maybe you knew? I mean, oftentimes it's come to me. I knew that, but that is so cool. What is something that you, interesting that you learned? Yeah. I think that uh, they have like these specialized kind of cells, and they're like kind of like hooks in a way, but not really. Like, I think they have like cyto or whatever, and they like, they like inject into something, and they tend to use like plants that are in their or something. And I didn't realize that. And when I think of like, or like, I don't really think of it doing that, you know, so I'm really surprised that they had that ability. Right, right. The, the mitocytes, um, which store these internal intracellular structures, the nematocysts, that fire. And, and part of the chapter talked about the pressures involved with fire and that, and that it's, it's, it's kind of coiled inside out, inside the cell, and then is shot out and there are barbs and such and a venom associated with it. That's that's what gives Nigerians their name and such a fascinating thing. The thing I wanted to share is that I remember they don't do this any longer, but there used to be an aquarium in California that would tell people that see these beautiful anemones and this you know this high school tank that we have for everyone, these actually have stinging cells in them. And you know, people would catch them. I don't think so. So that somebody had the bright idea of saying, okay, put your tongue and let it, you know, put your tongue onto the tentacle. Then you feel it. And so you know, a lot of people, oh, yes, they are. They do have stinging cells. And that didn't last too long because some people would have a swollen tongue after that and then you know, they face losses. Yeah. The stinging nature of these things is, is certainly something fascinating. What else? What other interesting feature do you learn from the chapter reading? Or that you've had a personal experience with the Nidera? Yes? Yeah. Um, I thought it was interesting that there were parasitic uh, organisms because, like, I've learned about parasitic wasps and things like that, but it was cool to know that there's, like, organisms in water that function in similar ways. Yeah, that, that, that certainly, that's something that gets me every time, I, I think, when I um, think about Nidarians again, is, is that those parasitic groups of Nidarians that infect fishes and cause various disease within fishes and are so reduced, they were previously thought to represent some other eukaryote. They weren't even recognized as Nidarians, but they do have nematocysts that are associated with attaching to hosts and so forth. So they do bear characters, but looking at them, just characterizing the disease organism of this fish, it's like, it's like a fucking Nidarian. And we think of Nidarians being free living beasts, not parasitic ones. So, yeah, certainly something I find fascinating as well. Others? Anyone have a personal experience with Nidarians? Nothing else? Nobody's ever been stung? You've been stung? Yeah. Uh, I was in Florida and like a really small like, jellyfish got washed up and I think I just touched it. <laughs> Did he grab its tentacles? Um, I think so, yeah. I was like eight. You're like eight, yeah. yeah. Forgive them. And, and, and many people have been stung that way. There are. Um, 
jellyfish that will wash up on the shore and oftentimes the tentacles can be very hurtful if you get stung by the nematocyst. Um, there are some that produce not the actual jellyfish, but what are siphonophores, Portuguese man o -wars, that have these floats to them. And the floats don't bear the maxis, so you pick them up by the float. But others, other jellyfish, true jellyfish, you can grab by the mouth, and they don't have the maxis on them. But some do, so you have to kind of know in advance what's safe to touch and what's not. Anything else? All right. We will address this question again on Wednesday, and maybe someone will have something interesting about Dino, you know, or something interesting they read about. All right, so Nidarians, like mentioned already, they have the singing cells. That's what gives them their name, Nidaria. Is a term that Nita Park refers to a nettle, a stinging nettle. There are plants that also can be stinging. The phylum is named after these. They're predominantly marine groups. There are also freshwater taxa within some of the groups within the phylum. I guess we could say there somewhere between nine and twelve thousand species. Nine thousand is what our book reports. Twelve thousand is what I see online for taxonomic. In terms of about nidarians, about 12,000 species of nidarians. The vast majority of these, 7,200 species, are in the class Anthozoa. These are Anthozoans. Things like sea anemones and corals. The group includes six different classes that different, differ in aspects of their life cycle and aspects of their anatomy. You could tell the different species or the different classes apart based on their overall structure. I'm not going to write these down again on the board. Five of these six are listed up here. The scyphozoans, scypho literally means cup, cup animals. The predominant form of these are known as the, the jellyfish, which you don't want to pick up, or they get sunk. Sometimes again, you can touch the bell, and they're known as the cells of the bell, but the tentacles, there are a number of the masses. These are what are used in prey capture. Skypozoans, not a very large group. It's only a few hundred species of skypozoans that are known. The other group are the hydrozoans, water animals. This is reasonably large. Thirty-eight hundred species. There are marine and freshwater forms. These have free-swimming stages, like you see in scyphozoans. They also have these attached polyp stages. Scyphozoans, most cnidarians, possess 
pro Pollock stage and let's turn to the soy stage. Fox jellies, cubazons. is another class, marine class. Only about 50 species. These also have a polyp stage and a medusoid stage, but the medusoid stage is that that is most well known. Identifying the polyp stages of cubazones can be extraordinarily difficult. Cubazones also are incredibly venomous. They could cause deaths within people. There, there are species around Australia that are purely seasonal and will wash ashore. They will close down beaches in Australia. And if you get stung, you can die. Starozoa are considered stocked medusoid forms because it's a medusoid form that is attached. This group is marine, mostly temperate, mostly cold water, fairly shallow water, though there are some deep sea star zones. But you only find them in this attached medusoid stage. And then the anthozoan, the largest of these classes, contains a variety of different subclasses we'll talk about today. Hexacoralia, hexa, six, they tend to exhibit six-fold symmetry. And then the octocoralia, or the polyps, exhibit eight-fold symmetry. These only exist as a polyp stage. There's no medusoid stage to answer that. Question? Yeah, um, there are five classes on the board, and you said there are six classes of species. Yep. So what is the sixth class? Someone mentioned it already, the, the parasitic class, which is which I don't have beautiful pictures of to show here. But the mixosomes is the parasitic class, and we'll be talking about them here, but these are the predominant five groups of free living. Typically, they're predatory organisms that use their nidocytes, their nematocysts, for capturing prey. So we have, within the anthozoans, we have hexacoralia and the octocoralia are the predominant groups within anthozoa. The anthozoa flower animals, and again, somewhere around 7,200 species, which represents the vast majority of all cnidarians. One of the interesting things I heard, or that I remember, I guess, in preparation of this, oftentimes we see octocorals, and octocorals are colonies of polyps that are interconnected there is one species of octocoral that is solitary. And oftentimes we think of octocorals as being colonial, like these multiple polyps embedded here. And so there's one species, at least a deep sea species off New Zealand, that is actually a solitary octocoral, which I, I knew about in the past, but every time I see that, I get surprised by it. Because it's just so hard. And then the six mixes elements, which I'm not showing here. And there's another group that's made up of a single species, polytonium, that is also a Like I mentioned with the sponges, our book tends to give nice little trees that show how these different groups are related. They also reveal 
which characters are shared or unique amongst the different groups. The first thing is always to look down here about what are those shared characteristics of the entire group. Nidotypes, we've already mentioned that a lot. Having a polyp body form, some taxa, it is lost. But um, ancestrally, they existed as a polyp -like type form, a polyp, an attached body. Planula type larva, and solid tentacles surrounding the mouth. And then the most basal group of cnidarians are the anthozoans, the flower animals, the sea anemones, corals, octocorals, and so forth. Is it hexaradial or octoradial symmetry, depending on which subclass you're dealing with? An anthozoan pharynx, like that. That's a bad way to describe a feature of an organism to say it has a pharynx like this group. These things have a unique pharynx that is different from the others, other aspects that are unique to them. And then these groups are the parasitic groups that appear to share common ancestry. So these are endoparasites. They occur within cells of vertebrates, fishes. We have a group where primary polyps are hollow that contains these other classes of cnidarians, the other four classes. The sarazoans we talked about already, these are the stocked jellyfish. There's, that's There's no medusoid stage here. The medusoid form evolved in the common ancestor of the hydrozoans, the scyphozoans, and the cubozoans. And then there are unique features for certain members of these groups that are distinct to those. The velum and the medusae, of hydrozoans, we'll see that when we talk about hydrozoans. There's a delarium in the medusoid of the cubozoan, but it's structurally distinct from the velum of the medusae. And there are differences between how the medusoid forms are produced. Here in the hydrozoans, we have budding, in the cubozoans, the polyp undergoes metamorphosis into the medusoid form. And I'm not going to define it here, but we'll see what I mean later. Strobilation, kind of like you have a polyp, and then it forms a bunch of layers, and each layer ends up forming into a medusa, as opposed to in the hydrozoans, a polyp is budding off a medusa. We'll see that, though, when we talk about these particular groups. But these figures are fantastic because they summarize a lot of information, features that are shared and features that are unique to each group. Fossil record of Nidarians. Most fossils date back to the Cambrian, but there are some fossils that appear to be Nidarians or at least early derivatives of the branch that gave rise to modern Nidarians. This is modern Nidarians. Some of these may be related to a deep common ancestor of Nidarians, what we refer to as basal uh, forms of Nidarians. This is a stem group. These are the crown. The crown group Nidarians, and these would be stem group Nidarians. Nidarians that may not possess all of the features that were evolved by the crown group that all share a unique common ancestor. These evolved earlier and descended from the lineage that ultimately gave rise to the common ancestor of the Nidarians. So some of these may represent those 
Magnum Tubus, which occurs in the Aetheran, about the middle Aetheran. It resembles the Anthozoan. And then there's these Clindularids, Clindularids, that date to the early part of the Aetheran, that are interpreted to represent possibly the Scythozoan. So these may represent stem groups to those particular classes, suggesting that Nigeria originated during the Edie period. So it has a very deep fossil record. Like I've kind of introduced already, Nigerians have two main body types the polyp and the medusa, polypoid and medusoid forms. The polypoid, polyp, attached, and as we, as we already saw in the tree, it's the ancestral condition. shared by the common ancestor of all Nidarians. A Nidarian that does not have the polypoid stage has lost it secondarily. The medusoid stage is free living. stage is produced either through budding, strobulation, or metamorphosis. This is scythosome, so you said it's strobulation. Cubosome, you can put metamorphosis. Hydrosomes, you said it's budding. They're budding off or producing these free living stages. The medusoid stages then are those that produce the gametes. And these stages are typically dioecious, separate male and female that produce the gametes. When we talked about gastrulation, I'm going to show the images like this to illustrate the fact that cnidarians undergo gastrulation, but only through the formation of the gut cavity, gastrovascular cavity, indicated here. So we do have two tissue types. These are only two. You don't see the formation of mesoderm. And these are diploblasts, a diploblastic, two tissue types with an outer endoderm, inner endoderm, Labeled here, outer epidermis, inner gastrodermis, and then the gastrovascular cavity can extend into tentacles. Yeah? Gamete production. 
Dioecious. So the Dioecious, separate, separate. Oh. Male and female. In between the two layers, we don't have mesoderm. We have mesoglia, which literally means middle blue. That is mostly an extracellular matrix, the jelly-like substance that gives structure to the body. I know my writing is horrible. Anything I see, a lot of people looking at the board. Anything on there that's confusing? I try to write as clearly as possible. What attitude did you guys look at? What is that? Diploblastic. Diploblastic. As opposed to us, we have three tissue types. Embryonic tissue types that develop and ultimately form a variety of other tissue types. But we're triploblastic because of the trigger. Yeah. What is the thing you wrote after the polyp? I know there's ancestral conditions, but like what's in After follow up, what does it say? Yeah, Attached. Yeah, good lord. And where do I, I want to find out how I can put on a light here. Because that is so dim, I can't even see it from over there. Let me see if I can do that light. Look, oh, that's horrible for our slides. If that makes, oh, that's what we want. That's that, I can only see that if I walk away. I mentioned a lot of, oh, of course. So both the polyp and the yeah. Dashiderm. 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 The exterior cell that is derived from the embryonic ectoderm. And dashiderm is derived from the embryonic endoderm. The only body cavity in these is the gastrovascular cavity. I mentioned earlier that a number of cnidarians are colonial. You'll see this as we go through the different groups. So you can think of a coral reef is made up of a coral with a bunch of little polyps. They all are connected to the other polyps via a shared gastrovascular cavity. So if this was a polyp of a coral, which then tells us a good fiction of one, there would be an opening to the next polyp. So they share a common gastrovascular cavity. When we talk about hydroids, we'll talk too about how different polyps in the colony can perform different functions. Some are feeding, some are defensive, and some are associated with reproduction, producing the gas. Closer view on the tissues that are involved. The tissues have the epidermis, the gastrodermis, have an underlying muscular nature to them. Longitudinal or circular myofibers that allow for some movement within the polyp or the medusoid form. There are specialized cells. This one shows them one on the periphery containing a nematocyst. These are known as nidocytes. Metal cells with nematocysts within. There's some cnidarians that also have nematocysts within their gastrodermis. That almost all have lots of batteries of nematocysts on their tentacles that are associated with prey capture. Internally, there are cells that are flagellated that allow for water movement to occur within the gastrovascular cavity. There are gland cells that are associated with digestion. This is a close-up, this is from the text, showing the epithelial muscular cells. These are called columnar-like cells that at their base 
have these muscular, contractile parts to them. Cnidarians have muscles. Their muscles are different than our muscles, in that our muscle cells are solely muscle cells. These cells can perform multiple functions. They can serve contractile function as well as producing various substances, aiding in digestion, and so forth. So they're a very different type of muscle cell than what you find in most other animals. But Nigerians have muscles. Here's a slide just showing how those muscles occur within a few different Nigerian groups, within some two different hydrozoans and anthozoans. And the green in these is standing for muscles. And you can see the different types of muscles that they have that are distributed throughout their tissues. Previous cell shows neurosensory cells, have a flagellum in these neurosensory cells, and then there are nerve cells that run in the epithelium that are capable of transmitting signals. In, in us and in most other animals, signals only pass in one direction within my area they're capable of being transmitted in both directions. However, the nerve, nervous system in Nidarians consists of a nerve net. There's no centralized nervous system, like we see in bilaterians. It's a nerve net throughout the body of the organs. We saw stain of muscles. These are stains showing the nerves. So some of these you can see the muscles within. These are the nerves forming a neck around these tissues. This is from a medusoid showing the neck along. I think this is a radial canal of the bell. My hands, muscles and nerves. So in terms of how, if, if you, if we had a nerve net, I think, you know, you would notice that there's something and it would send signal throughout the rest of the body. Can they locate where yeah. it's coming from? I suspect they could, but I do not know. I'm not an expert in nervous system. But that's a good question. Some, you know, whenever we have great questions in class, but sometimes I don't have a chance to write them down. Think about it, write it down, and then see if you can investigate that. And if you do figure it out, let me know. I will try to, oftentimes when I get back from class, I try to write these things down, but I don't often do. Um, but it's a very good question. Yeah. I'm just confused, but how does the nerve net facilitate sort of physiological responses in different people about central nervous system? And is it just that there's no central No central processing of it. That's probably related to her question too. That's another good question. So we talked a little bit about these already. The nidocytes house these intracellular organelles, the nematocyst. There are typically a curriculum that covers the opening of that nematocyst. And then the cell, there's a modified cilium that kind of works as a trigger for the firing of the nematocyst. Yeah, how often are these throughout the body? Like, they, are they on every single cell on the outside? Are they scattered throughout? Like, where, like, how, what's the frequency? What's the frequency? I don't have an exact frequency, but they tend to be. So if you wanted to find um, 
nematocysts on a sea anemone, I would definitely look at the tentacles. Um, same thing with on a cytosome, looking at the tentacles. And I mentioned earlier, some cytosomes you can pick up by the bell because they don't bear any nematocysts, but that's not true in all cases, so I don't recommend doing that. But typically they're concentrated on the tentacles. Many, many cytosomes, true jellyfish, have concentrations of them that I think can be visible to the naked eye, but definitely under microscope, these battery nematocysts that are all together. So they can be highly concentrated within certain parts, but typically tentacles that are involved with these. Here it's showing one and associated with the, the body wall of this hybrid here. But some nigerians also have them on the internal, so something gets consumed and the masses can still fire for their prey item. And these nematocysts, many of them will inject directly into tissue. So this is showing, here we have the tentacle, showing these concentrations of nematocysts, and the NB is an abbreviation for nematocyst battery. So these concentrations of nematocysts, a close up of one of those is similar to what we saw before. But why I like this figure is it shows Nematocysts firing into tissue, going through the epidermis, dermis, into subcutaneous tissue, and then releasing a venom. I study venoms of cone snails, other people study venoms of snakes, and spiders, and scorpions, and so forth. And most of these taxa have venom producing tissues that are comprised of cells, but they're typically a bit of land, the case of cone snails and that's that. Nigerians are kind of unique in that it's a single cell that is producing the nematocysts as well as the venom. So it's a very different system than what you see in the other venomous types of organisms. So my plan for today and Wednesday, part of Wednesday, is to cover the different classes, talk about the diversity of forms, aspects of their biology that is unique to them, their life cycles, and so forth. So I'm going to start here at the base and talk about the anthrosome. As you can think, as they share a lot of features that were ancestral, that were not subsequently modified, for example. Anthrozoans do not have a medusoid stage. Why? Because that presumably evolved out here. I mentioned already, Cnidarians have represent, or, I'm sorry, anthozoans represent the vast majority of all Cnidarians. There are about 7,200 species of anthozoans and somewhere around 4,000 species of Cnidarians. And these make up five orders, but we're only going to be talking about the major orders here, the minor orders are relatively small. The major ones, really ones, Hexacoralia, Hexa 6, they tend to exhibit a hexamorous body plan based on six-fold symmetry, and they consist of I got that wrong. Sclerotinian corals, hard corals, sclera, hard anemone, and black corals or spiny corals are both, though, 
actually put those where are known as tube anemones in a subclass and Anthesparians are these black squirrels and spiny squirrels, and two anemones are known as anthesparians. So these are put together in a particular group years ago, but they've since been divided for Cerianthera to represent the distinct subclass within anthozoans, and black corals, spiny corals are actually hexacorallic. All of these groups, including the Cerianthariums, exhibit this hexamorous symmetry, much phylogenetic data, and other morphological features suggest that tube anemones are distinct from other anemones. The other main group are the octocorals, hexacorallia is about half or so in terms of number of species in the, in the subclass, about uh, half of them are in the class. Half of anthozoans are hexacorallians, about the other half are the octocorallians. There's slightly more octocorallians than hexacorallians. Octocorals exhibit octomerous symmetry, eightfold symmetry. They're, except for that one species, they're colonial animals. And there are things like these soft corals. And we can see, counting these tentacles, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They exhibit eight tentacles. How else are these? You may not be able to see that in that image. But how are these tentacles different than those tentacles? Aside from their number, they are pinnate. They have these little side projections on them. Hexacorallians don't exhibit those. They're also colonial. These are genetically identical individual polyps that are interconnected by a shared gastrovascular cavity. Sea pan, a lot of hard parts produced by sea pans, sea whips, other types of octocorals, and there's numerous polyps embedded within that skeleton. And there are things like sea pens. You can see the individual polyps here. This is a single polyp from the shaft. And individual polyps of the sea pen. Hopefully, we're getting some of some of these at least. But I don't think we're getting any true soft corals. So we're getting some sea pen, sea pens, and sea pansies in lab this week to be able to identify aspects that are unique to the octocorals. So hexacorallia tend to be colonial, but not all are colonial. Plenty of sea anemones that are solitary. There's some hard corals as well, I don't have an image here, that are solitary, and some are quite large. Large polyp, fungias, type of mushroom coral, represented as a single polyp. Section, there's an image from the text showing that if you take a cross section of the animal, there are these septa that divide the gastrovascular cavity. You can see a hole down near the base, near the foot of the anemone, and then there's the septa that subdivide those regions. On that tree, it mentioned the siphonoglyph. A unique feature of anthozoans. And these are simply the channels at the edges of the pharynx, the mouth, that are ciliated, that allow for water currents to develop so that water can move within the gastrovascular cavity. It provides a bit of a hydrostatic skeleton to the anemone by maintaining 
water pressures within the body. There are some sea anemones that, pre pre that possess these extensions from septa. The label here is a concha that can emerge from pores in the body wall and act defensively. There are certain species of sea anemones. I don't think we'll have any in the lab. Apasia is one. If we get that, that if you bother it, it will convert these at the sides of its body walls. <clears throat> Hexacorallians are, um, they can be monoecious or dioecious and they can undergo asexual reproduction by budding. Here's the anemone splitting apart to form two separate individual solitary anemones, or if they stick together with the shared gastrovascular cavity, they form a colonial form. And here, this must be dioecious anemones, with the one on the top. These are granular, relatively large. That's a female producing eggs. And this looks like a male producing sperm. So they tend to spawn their gametes, and fertilization takes place in the water column. Oh, and have this. And a lot of anemones, I think I use an image for the canvas site, which is a hermit crab that has an anemone. And to me, it's, it's, it's a fantastic little beast because it's a combination of a crustacean, a snail, this is what the shell it uses, and an anemone. And, and of course, there may be other species involved in interactions there too that we just don't see. But those three different phyla interacting on that one. The shell is bitter, but the anemone is live on the gast gastropod shell that the hermit crab is using, and it, it can be serve a defensive purpose potentially for that crab. Here, this is just a short little video. There are, anyone heard of a, a boxer crabs? It's a genus of crabs known as Libya, and they hold sea anemones in their claws and use them defensively. They're known as boxer because they punch with the sea anemones, or pom-pom crabs because these look like two little pom-poms. And this is just a short little video of how a boxer crab and go from one on how many to two. And this is a sped up video, but he's, or she, is taking the anemone and splitting it in two. So they, a lot of times they'll undergo fission to produce a second one. But he started off with one, and then it'll be two. I think he will study aspects of the behavior of these two in terms of one will steal the anemones of the other if you take it. And then it's away. So those are anemones, corals also are related to anemones, and then the scleractinian. These secrete a calcium carbonate exoskeleton, as shown here. Skeleton and septi are formed internally within the polyps of anemones. They're also formed within polyps of corals, and they result in the sclerosecti of the coral skeleton. Mentioned for colonial nidarians, they share common gastrovascular cavity, as shown here, so this would be attached to the next polyp. But otherwise, relatively similar in aspects of their anatomy to anthrozoans. Corals, though, are important because they form reefs. And why are, why are coral why are coral reefs important?
Then we get a good reason why we should care for that coral reef. Yeah. It provides value not just for Right. They can they so they, they provide services. They provide services to us in terms of ecotourism. They could be a considerable source to, of, of monetary gain for various communities, and so forth. They I think did I write it down? Yeah, I did. That it's it's been reported that coral reefs host one third of all marine species. I want to know where that number comes from, because that sounds incredibly large. One third of all marine species are hosted within coral reefs. How did the coral reefs know what to do and not to stay? Like, for example, clownfish go into coral reefs, but they don't get done by the That's, so certain certain organisms that occur with um, anthozoans, so they're they're actually occurring with with um, sea anemones, the, the clownfish, and so they can get I think they get immune to it, but I'm not positive. Another good question. I'm, I'm pretty sure that organisms that have a very tight relationship with cnidarians, uh, with, with anthozoans, get acclimated to them, but. Good question. I'm not sure. So, oh. If I like send that at one of my classes, they like, it's not that the anemone doesn't sting them, they have like some type of layer around them that like prevents them to sting them. Okay, so. So it's not like the anemone is not stinging them, but like they evolve to have like a layer around them that makes it stick to it. Interesting. So I did not know that um, fish have a protection yeah, from them, so they don't get stuck. Like okay. I know a colleague who works on cone snails with me, he'll always say, yes, cone snails are associated with coral reefs, but they can never walk on them because they would get hurt. They get stung in their feet, he would say, uh, which is true, which is probably true. I've never, put, I've never seen one of my snails on on an actual coral. There can be organisms that are associated with them. Crustacean, lobster crab, presumably they don't have areas that the nematocysts can get into, right? If we were handling a cubozoan with gloves, we wouldn't have to worry about its nematocysts entering into us. I suspect that's the case for crustaceans, but good question. But back to coral reefs, corals ecotourism purposes. They host a variety of different organisms within the habitats they provide. Right? They, they provide structure. Oftentimes we could just put out a, you know, a ship. Oftentimes this was done in the Gulf of America, like old, the Gulf of Mexico, with old ships were sunk and they would provide structure and they form an artificial reef, artificial coral reefs provide a living reef, so it can attract organisms to settle within its areas. So coral reefs are important for a number of different reasons. Something else that they do provide too, they provide coastal protection. So a coral reef off of an island can reduce the wave energy hitting that island and therefore reduce erosion and impacts to tsunamis. So coral reefs provide a number of different services. They are largely restricted to tropical and subtropical waters. Queer waters. These corals, reef building corals, also have associations with dinoflagellates. Dinoflagellates, we didn't talk about, they're a type of single cell eukaryote that is photosynthetic. They have pigments, they're in sand fields, 
at the fields, at the fields. And they can be free living kind of flashes, but they can be taken up by coral. And the dinoflagellates then undergo photosynthesis and then are providing materials for photosynthate. Association with another organism. Now, these are known as so xanthella, and so xanthella. The cyanoflagellates associated with corals, and that's what provides a lot of the cellular building blocks to the corals. So they need to occur in clear water so that the zoosanthellates can actually photosynthesize. If they're in rather turbid waters near the river, they're not going to be able to photosynthesize. There are no major coral reefs off the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico because the waters are so very turbid. So they tend to be restricted to tropical and subtropical areas that tend to have high clarity to the water. And I think we've all heard the fact that there's a lot of bleaching events that go on because of warming, ocean currents that are warming, which cause the zoosanthellae to leave the coral tissues. If once those cells are removed from the tissues, the coral's loss of source of energy, the coral then can also die. Corals are, are similar in their antizoan. They produce the, the polyp stage, is the stage that produces the gametes, which is the only group where it's not the medusoid form that is producing the gametes modified medusoid form that's producing the gametes. I, I, I talked about when we talked about reproduction, the fact that if you're interested in rearing lots of corals to reintroduce them to an area, you can fragment them and then grow them and then deposit them where you're hoping to recover a reef. They also engage in reproduction, um, spawning of gametes, and fertilization within the water column. They can undergo massive spawning events. That's all sperm and egg from a massive spawning event. Cool. Some species release gametes that are male or female. They may be dioecious, or they release packets of sperm and egg are all together. And there's a little movie to describe some of these. It tends to happen at night. Some corals come in and release clouds of sperm. Nearby, the female will be releasing eggs. Other species of coral are both male and female. These release packages of eggs already pre-wrapped in sperm.
eggs and sperm float to the surface to mix with others from further along the reef. Each kind of coral times its release to a certain hour on a certain night. That maximizes the chances of cross-fertilization. The fertilized eggs drift away from the reef. And the embryo cell divisions forming what's considered a planula larval stage that would eventually settle and form an individual. If it were a coral, like in its we're seeing in these images, colonial in coral would form a single polyp and then start to form multiple individual polyps and ultimately large structures like this that is comprised of numerous polyps, thousands. Right. The other major subject kind of introduced this already, Octocorallia, Thomas. Symmetry, the eightfold symmetry, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight tentacles. We would see that if we could see these closely as well, and these and the polyps present here, and the individual polyps present in the C pen. Eightfold symmetry. Tentacles are pinnate. They exhibit these little structures coming off from the main tentacle. Again, vast majority are colonial. There's only one lot of species that is solitary octocoral. The individual polyps are interconnected through tubes, the gastroderm, and the selenia, selenia and they produce like structures that are connecting them. Endoskeleton. also may produce sclerites that also give them construction. Carbonate. Sclerites, which are somewhat analogous to the hard parts of the sponges that we talked about last week. Sticulous. And then again, our class, or our class, our text puts together the cerianthariums, which are the tube anemones, and the antithariums, which are the black corals and the hard corals, as a single subclass. Ceriantharia is members of this group, mentioned already, exhibits cameras symmetry. Tube anemones. Produce a tube. The tube is comprised of fire masses and mucus. None of the other anemones in Anthozoa do this. Just the Sarianthariums exhibit a tube, and you typically find them solitary in soft sediments. Question. Oh, you can't see through the bar. Yeah, I told you. And I can't wait to see this. Captain carbonate sclerites are produced with an optical scleritis. I can regulate it. So you guys can see, you guys can see that. I told you. 
Captain Carmen's Clarence. Antipatharium, so black corals, oftentimes you'll see jewelry that's made from some black corals. They tend to be rather deep sea things, so you often don't see them unless you're searching for involvement in ROV activities. But this modern taxonomy, this is where I think our book is wrong, places the Serianthurium as a unique subclass within Anthozoa. It's at the same level as the Hexacoralia and Octocoralia. Whereas the Antipatharians are in order within Hexacoralia. That's what modern phylogenetics suggests, and possibly the next edition of our text will do that. Alright, so people get through the anthozoans today. Plan for Wednesday to discuss these other groups. Hydroids are relatively complex, so I'll spend a little bit of time on them. But you know, sparazoans, cubazoans, because most of our skypazoans are be able to cover relatively quick, so we'll be able to discuss these groups and then the chia forest, and then have a discussion about who is the most faithful and what does it mean if chia forests are actually the most faithful or if sponges are the most faithful based on what characteristics these groups show. All right, any questions before we wrap up for today? So the question was, does nematocysts be trained for recognizing particular prey? I do not, and whether or not that's only certain nematocysts, or is that all nematocysts and nematocysts? I'm not positive on exactly how that works and how they would be with between the different prey. It must be based on chemosensory aspects, so I'm not sure how that would, or it's the movement maybe to trigger the nematocysts. Good question. These are good questions. These are worth. Where's the investigation?